This barge is named after Emmeline Pankhurst. It's taking us to the fan debate that we're going to do in wholesale football. <laughs> he cannot not turn up for his football club. I've just said that. You're ignoring that bit. So the presenter is Josh Denzel. He's ex-Love Island, but he's a presenter. OK. Love Island barge. Not very Roy Keane, that, is it? Welcome to the first Overlap Live fan debate. If we continue to fail to rebuild, are the Glazers worried? Are you excited for me, the fans? Uh, Truthfully, no, not really, but I'll engage with him. <laughs> but what's it? He's a great pro and he trains properly. He turns up. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> nice stadium there, lads. Hey, happy memories. A few bad ones. And Gabby Bonlo will rip me part out there. <laughs> I mean, find it hypocritical. Why are you buying rejects from Chelsea? You're over yeah, 30. That's just stupid. No, it's not stupid. It is it? stupid. <laughs> <laughs> right, we are. We've got four questions for our panel. First one, which newcomer are you most looking forward to seeing this season? Could be a player, manager, club? Varane. Yeah? Yeah. Obviously, world-class player, done everything, just want to see how he does at Old Trafford. See how he partners Harry Maguire. Um, You're right. intrigued to look at the teams who get promoted. I want to see how, I'd be interested to see how Brentford get on. Play a great brand of football. Obviously, they've got a way of doing things down there with their recruitment. It'd be interesting to see how they cope with the demands of the Premier League. Ivan Tony, someone you, you want to watch out for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, again, a good player, but the question mark is always, can they do it in the top, the top league? And um, we'll soon find out if they're up to it. Cara? I'm looking forward to seeing Benitez at Everton. Yeah? Yeah. OK. I yeah. just want to sit back with a big, massive uh, pile of popcorn and just watch this, <laughs> watch this unfold. <laughs> this will... Uh, what's that? Well, listen, <laughs> I'm just there. Uh, I am very intrigued. Yeah. I mean, my dream scenario. Yeah. The first half is at Goodison, isn't it? Yeah. It's the Liverpool to go one nil up, two nil up at Goodison, and the Liverpool fans to start chanting Rafa Benitez's name and just watch the reaction in that stadium. Do you know what I'm doing? Don't chant it. Well, it could happen every year we were playing. <laughs> do you know when we do an Everton game away? Will you be getting a helicopter back with him like you did at Newcastle? Oh Ooh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> He put on a helicopter just to make sure he got favourable uh, words off us at Sky oh, aye. at that time. Because he's still... You're Steve Bruce's mate, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. He actually tried to get a player off Steve Bruce. We're not going to get him It was the centre-back you tried to get off him. No, he always gives Rafa an easy time, like he's on his helicopter with him, has meals with him and stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not pleasant. Conflicted, actually. You know what I was Not as easy a time as you give Harry Kane. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, do you know what I was going to ask? You know, I was going to come on to it a little bit later, but it's, it's, we've touched on it now. Is Rafa going to be quite sly and maybe go for a cup and forget the league? You, you know him well. I don't think that's being sly. I think that's being clever. <laughs> that, that's what an Everton, an Everton manager should do. Everton are not going to win the league. They're not going to get in the top four. They may be there <laughs> or thereabouts for Europa League. That's yeah. what Rafa will have to try and push for. But the biggest thing for... Everton fans, and I know a lot of Everton fans, a uh, guy there from uh, Toffee TV, they've got to win a trophy. It doesn't matter if Everton finish 14th, forget the league. Mm. It's about the cup. And the, the, the big problem teams like Everton have got, and maybe even Tottenham, these teams yeah. have gone a long time about winning a trophy, is Man City. Yeah. The, the, the squad, Pep Guardiola's just like that drive to win every trophy. Jürgen Klopp, I don't think, is too bothered in yeah. terms of the cups. Maybe that you could say that maybe other managers were at the top, but Man City just want to win everything. And that's a huge problem for, for teams like we're talking about. You almost feel like you'd have to beat City to win that trophy, and that's very difficult to do. But Rafa Benitez will be judged on the job he does overall. Of course he will be. But if Rafa Benitez in two years could have won a trophy, uh, and I'm not sure, I don't think he'll be there for two years, but if he could have won a trophy, it, 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 that whole thing of like 25, what is it? What is it now? I'm deadly sick. Uh, tw 26, 26 <laughs> years know. since winning a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in last time he won. I didn't want to say 36. <laughs> I don't like the Benitez one at all, to be honest. No, no, no I don't like it. I, I, look, to be honest with you, I've got a soft spot for him on a serious note, because when he was in Spain, he was one of the managers that I thought was really good with me after the game when we played against them, and I thought that he was really, you know, giving a lot of advice, what to do and stuff like that. Did you take it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's actually, to be fair, he's really good. But I just think, how can Everton have Rafa Benitez, uh, you know, a Champions League winning manager from Liverpool? I, I don't get it at all. I just think there's certain things. I get football, it's business. I get the fact that you can go and play for a different club. But the idea that you take a manager from Liverpool to go to play 
to go to uh, to Everton is I'm I'm really struggling with it. It'd be like Jurgen Klopp coming to Manchester United. It'd be like I don't know. It just what doesn't... about a player like Sol Campbell going to Arsenal? Arsenal fans. I know, but look at how that's viewed. I know. And look, at the end of it, I get it. It happens, and it just I just that this one doesn't feel right because there's so many managers out there that you could pay a lot of money to to do that job. I don't feel like Sol Campbell. There's not many good English centre halves around at the time. You know, two or three in each Premier League season, you might say. But generally, <laughs> there's not. No, you, 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 Rio Ferdinand, you, you obviously had Carrie, you had uh, John Terry, uh, Sol Campbell, there's four. So if one becomes available and that, that guy wants to go to the other club, I personally wouldn't go to Liverpool, I wouldn't go to City, I wouldn't go to Leeds. Not for anything. But the idea that Everton do a point Rafa Benitez, I get it's football and business, it's just I don't like it. He doesn't want to move out. Oh, Rafa, Rafa's, big, <laughs> Rafa's biggest problem at Everton, besides the obvious one with Liverpool, is the players. Everton players are nowhere near good enough, so he's going to be under the cosh. He's not walking into a group of players. Ancelotti went in the last year and everyone at Everton was getting giddy and excited. And you're looking going, but look at the players. OK, they brought a couple of quality players in, but they started well for the first month or two. But we knew these, some of these foreign lads can't deal with the demands for the whole season. So Rafa, for all that... His connections with Liverpool, the pl Everton I, players. I think no, he'll do better than Ansotti. No, he will do better. He'll do better than Ansotti. No, I, I think he. I yeah, think I, he'll do I do. Yeah. But that wouldn't be hard. Angelotti, you know, <laughs> really struggled. He really yeah. struggled. And Rafa will no doubt look to ship some of the players on and try and get better players in. Should we get an Everton fan point of view? I mean, you, you're, you're in the mix. What do you think of Rafa? Are you saying we can't win the league? <laughs> <laughs> That's the recruitment being good. The championship next year. Pack it in, pack it in. <laughs> You'd have been all right if you'd have come to us instead of Celtic. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, listen, Rafa Benitez wouldn't have been in my top five managers to take over at Everton, but the owner has got very different views than, uh, than the fans, quite clearly, so you've got to get behind them. I actually think with this squad, he's a better fit than Ancelotti. Ancelotti, great if you've got world-class players and you can say go and play, but Everton need a, a coach, mm. not someone who, who raises an eyebrow and drinks coffee on the side. We need someone who's going to get in and, and, you know, Jamie will know this, get in, get the defenders defending properly. And I, I look at Everton and just think, well, he is a better fit. And I know, but you make the point, sir, about the coaching. Don't, don't overestimate coaching. You need a, you need no, a, no, you I need the players. No, I you need the, You look at Everton's yeah. group of players. Last year, even when they were having a good spell, I couldn't figure Everton out. I couldn't even understand how they were like, at some stage, they were fourth or fifth for a while, but then they faded away. You thought they it's found their true colours. <laughs> Sorry? They were top for a while. They were top, obviously, yeah. in September. That's a yeah, great yeah. time to be top. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, <laughs> six hundred were top as well. It's October. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> you know, you get no medals then. Yeah. But we co co go back to coaching. Yeah, yeah. But Rafa, they still need players to walk with. No, but you've got it. Uh, that is totally correct, without a, without a shadow of a doubt. But you also have got to do a bit of coaching, right? You can't just go. Go and play. True, you true. Can't Everton were too open, definitely. Of we had it with Moyes. We had it with David Moyes. He won't, he won't go for a midfield of, say, Davis and Gomez or yeah. something like God, that, which no. is what Ancelotti did at the time. He was like, so open. He won't do that, Rafa. No. He'll play two centre half. Listen, listen, there. listen. He wasn't open. Ancelotti was defensive. Everton were defensive last year. Everton were boring. Let's be totally honest about mm. Gary Dewey. Look, you know, you went again. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Everton were very. They were born to watch the terrible home record, and I, I love Carlo and around the corner. He was great for the city. I was talking great about it. Great to have Ancelotti, you know, big name manager. But he was never an event manager. Mm. He, he was never an event manager. And I think you're spot on what you say in terms of needing those sort of great players and keeping those players happy. Yeah. The opposite is true of Benitez. Benitez didn't work at Real Madrid or into Milan when he had sort of mega stars. Yeah, yeah. When he had his best time even at Liverpool was when we were at our worst in some ways. Mm. When he first came in, when we were actually at our best or we had the best team. We didn't win as maybe much as we should have done, but yeah. you know, the first year Champions League and FA Cup. Uh, Valencia a team fighting against sort of Barcelona, Real yeah, Madrid. Yeah, yeah. Same with Napoli, you won a couple of trophies there against Juventus. So in terms of fit, in terms of Everton Football Club trying to improve them or being better than Ancelotti, I agree. But this is not about the group of players here. We're talking about Rafa Benitez at Everton. The fans in the pre-season game here last week were already chanting against them. Somewhere. Let's when you say somewhere, but what I'm saying is it doesn't matter. That, you know what it's like? Someone videos it, goes on social media, everybody's talking about it. You know that stadium, which can be very hostile at times, can be a benefit for Everton and a negative for them. That stadium will never get behind Rafa Benitez, no matter what. I can't see that happening. Even you may after tell a me run of six pardon? or seven good games. No chance. It, it, it's not even just the fact that he was at Liverpool, which is a big problem. It's the fact he's loved at Liverpool. It's the fact of Istanbul champion. It's like... Even Liverpool fans, 
still love them. That's the problem. That's it. it, it, it it's always going to be there. It's never going to go away. And you, what, 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 how can Rafa ever change it? What can he do so that he's actually there next season? I think if you lost the derby game badly, that stadium yeah, would that, be like, it'd be impossible, I think, for him to carry that's on. That's a huge if, though. We've lost one home derby in 11 years. So, it, regardless of, and we've had I Sam, mean, if you won. And we've had, no, no, that's a good point. You've also, we've also had Sam Allardyce playing against Jürgen Klopp. So, you know, it's a little bit like... <laughs> I can know, see Hugo Martina and Gary Neville. It's, it's different <laughs> things, you know. <laughs> The thing about no, it is, and I'm, I'm bigging you up there, by the way. World class compared to Kuka. Um, but the thing about it is, the owners brought him in. The owners brought them on. We fans made it quite clear before whether they wanted Rafa Benitez or not. So I think it's dead easy to go. We won't survive the season. He won't survive this. He won't survive that. I think he'll have to put everything in trouble before the owner will get rid of him. And the owner doesn't mind get rid of him, by the way. He's done, we've been on through our six manager in five years, so I think... There's, there is a split in the board, though, isn't there? We know for a fact Bill yeah, Kenwright yeah, yeah. must be absolutely aghast that Rafa Benitez is the manager. You can see that in his actual statement. The statement was about six words. No, it was, but, <laughs> but the owner... If you're, you own the football club, as Gary does there, and, you know... He changes not, the manager more exactly. than you. <laughs> there you go. So if the owner will have the say, won't he? So at the end of the day, what do we do? Do we go into the game on Saturday and, and we're all against Benitez? No, no, what I'm saying is or, if, if you... If the, say it's 70 minutes gone, you're getting beat 1-0 on to Southampton, mm. it can happen. I'm just mm. thinking of even early on in a season where you're just thinking, when the fans are just not buying into it and you've got Liverpool fans sort of laughing if it's not going you know, well. Do you know, know what it's like the City? No, I know. And you're right, Amy, but what I'm saying is when the problem Everton had throughout the summer, and we've, you know, we've got a big channel, we have a lot of fans asking questions, nobody could decide who they wanted. So he'd say, oh, I, I'd want Graham Potter, play great football, let's take our time and build up. No, no, he's never done anything. We want this manager or Nuno. No one wanted Nuno. Duncan Ferguson. What happened with Duncan? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, to be honest, yeah, we did want Duncan. But a lot of fans, Roy, he will definitely get relegated if we get him with no evidence. Well, exactly, exactly. There's no evidence. He had ever. He was unbeaten. The only Everton manager to have more than one game and not lose a game in, in our history. So there you go. And no one wanted him. There was but other managers. That, that's a sign of a struggling club mm. when you become that confused. You don't yeah. know what type of manager you even want. Exactly. And that, and we have lost I, that. I, one. Look, I. Personally, I feel like I'm really Everton won in the '80s, playing a certain style. I think Moyes, to be fair, had that grit. They were, hot, you know, I think they were really good characters down the spine, good personalities. If you go to Goodison Park and you're a you're a fan, you're spirited, you're passionate, you want players who care about the club. Whenever I think of Everton as a kid, as Gary said, or going to Goodison as a player, that's our well, what do you remember them as a blue? What's what's your memory? Because you've been all over the, Europe up, with them. Yeah, yeah up and up at them. them yeah. Two big centre forwards, getting the ball into the box, exactly. a mix of great football, but thinking, oh, this is an aggressive, powerful team, yeah, set yeah. pieces. That, that for so me, what, is evident. What manager would you have... If you now, were... I think, if, I, if you think of... <laughs> you won't want to, but even if you think of Liverpool teams under Benitez, yeah. now, you mightn't say exciting, but you, you think powerful, yeah, organised, yeah. strong. There are elements of what you think of an Everton manager. Yeah. That, that, that's, and I said at the time, all the names that you had of... Nuno and all these different things. Benitez was far better for Everton than so any of them. If it wasn't Everton, if it was that sort of similar club, but you can't get away from the fact of Liverpool. But I just want to ask the uh, Red and TV on what the feeling of Liverpool fans to Rafa on this is not is not hostile at all. No, no, I, I, everyone wishes him well. I think that's I think that's telling. But and why it, though? No, I, no, because it's, it's telling because if Rafa Benitez was a threat, I think we'd be more bothered. You know what I mean? No, no, no. But if, but if we if we were losing when Rafa moved on, we were heartbroken because we went from Rafa Benitez to Roy Hodgson, which was a massive step down in terms of quality and in terms of standing in the game. I, I really like Rafa. And there was a point where we all well not all, but there was a lot of Liverpool fans who wanted Rafa back. We've got Jurgen now, and it's and it, we, Liverpool have moved beyond Benitez. I think so. I think there's a lot of people who, who wish him well, and I think there's something that he brings to the city, which I think is class. I think he brings, he's, a, he's, a good, he's a good man at, at his heart, and I think that's maybe something that Everton actually could benefit from. Having do, you, do you think that could change if actually Everton start doing well and Liverpool don't, or yeah. Everton win the derby Look, game? we're all sat exactly like you going, someone says, are you going to sing the Rafa Benitez song We're in the Merseyside derby? And I, was, I don't think we'd sing it pre-match, but 10 minutes to go, if you're 3-0 up, my God, that song is going to get sung. <laughs> so, um, Never but, but, but just so he'll, know, be, he'll be clapping you as well. Yeah. But we had it when Julier came back. He would. Uh, when Julier came back, we were what, singing Julier's song and Aston Villa fans. What's the difference? And I'm not just trying to defend him because he, he's my mate, but <laughs> Everton, Everton and Man United are the two biggest rivals for Liverpool, always will be. 
Michael Owen is slow to sort of making that move to Man United. Now, we never left Liverpool to go to Man United. Benitez hasn't left Liverpool to go to Everton. You know, they're both great for the club. You know, what Michael's done in terms of goals. I know Rafa in the Champions League, I get that. Can you explain the different sort of way of seeing sort of Michael and Benitez? Because well, Benitez has also gone to Chelsea as well, who were a big rival of Liverpool. Well, Man United, well Michael Owen won the title with United. And that's galling to see someone like that go and do that. Now, if, if, if Liverpool were in a position where a few years ago where we sacked Kenny Dalglish, but, my, uh, but Everton gave Moyes a new contract and they finished very similar in terms of league position and all that. If, if we got to a position where Rafa Benitez was coming in and he was taking Everton to that next step, somewhere we couldn't go, then I think we'd be raging with that because we've lost out. We haven't. We've got this guy in Everton. I've got him and they're benefiting from him. I think Rafa's a great manager, I, I really do, and I agree, I think he's a great coach, and I think he'll get better out of the component parts than some of the managers would at Everton, but you've got that sword of Damocles hanging over the head that if ever it goes wrong, the guy who lives next door to you is going to rip the piss out of you big time, because our manager's gone and done that. Agent <laughs> Rafa, the t-shirts are ready. Oh, the they're ready? Are ready. Oh, Agent <laughs> <Rafa>. <laughs> Don't let you, I know you've got a couple. <laughs> uh, can I sign one? <laughs> It's lovely to have so many reds with Rafa Benitez tattooed on them. Manager <laughs> <laughs> tattooed on them, so it's all good. It's all good. Uh, we, could, we could go on all day about this, but um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is what do you think will surprise us this season? I'll start with uh, you, Will. <laughs> Well, the whole idea when you go into a season, there's fans are you're hopeful or some fans will be despondent before the season starts because they might not have got the players they're in or they might have got the manager they didn't want. So there's always that hope and there's always that surprise in the game, isn't it? That's why we watch the game of football. You just, you just never know what's going to happen. We're all sitting here thinking if Man City or Chelsea will win the league, who will get relegated, probably two or the three promoted teams will get relegated. But it doesn't work out that way. That's how, I think that's why we love the game. But trying to predict and pan out the surprises, then who knows? We've seen it over the years. We've seen Leicester, that was the perfect storm in terms of win the league. We've seen teams get promoted and have fantastic seasons. But we're, because we've worked, I suppose, involved with the bigger clubs, we're always intrigued mm. by what happens at the top. But we hear it here, you know, we hear, listen to supporters. We, it's great to have this chat as well. You, you soon find out how passionate people are about their yeah. own football club. Okay, we're trying to be professional and we talk about at a professional level, but the passion that comes across here is fantastic. And that's what I think we've all missed over last year. That passion is fantastic. And, it's coming true here with all the opinions, even if we don't necessarily agree with them. Right, we're, we're going to get into it. Um, I want to know, which former player from your club would you like to see back? Like, imagine from at their peak as well. Uh, possibly Ian Rush, centre-forward. That's what I said, uh, Liverpool need. Or Louis Suarez is probably still playing as a former player. Probably, uh, you know, a real sort of goal scorer. That's where I think Liverpool might fault of this season I know the defenders are coming back but I even felt last season the problem was actually scoring goals yeah. and I think there's too much pressure on Salah and Mane and if they go through a little spell of four or five games where they don't score you think where else are the goals coming from so Liverpool don't have midfielders who score really Van Dijk might have five or six set pieces uh, really but I'd like someone who could come in and sort of take the burden off uh, certainly Mo Salah so I'll say him Rush Right what about yourself? What a player bloody hell No I'd say for United um, do you know what we had? Thank God, we're very, very lucky. We, we some good full-backs. <laughs> Phil, Dennis Irwin, Parks. We all had great characters. Yeah. What, what would you bring back to this team? Would you bring a, a Mark Hughes, a Canton or somebody like that, just to yeah. lift the place? Scores, he'd be brilliant. Um, obviously, I can't say myself. That'd be embarrassing. <laughs> uh, never probably say me. But no, no, but it's, again, I go back to yeah. the brilliant players, but what we always had, and Jamie probably say the same, what, what the big clubs, in, huge characters. Mm. When we were at United, Lee Sharp, Giggsy, Brilliant fellas, brilliant fellas, Dennis Irwin. But if I had to pick one to come back to this United team, keeper. Uh, yeah, keeper's a good point. Yeah, I'd say. Some legendary I'll tell keepers. you what, no, Michael was overrated. No, I go with. Uh, <laughs> I go, go, go with Scalzi. Scalzi. Scalzi in midfield, yeah. Gary. <sighs> I would. I would probably. I would probably say Roy or Cristiano. Okay. Cristiano does 35, 40 goals, and I think straight away, if he went up front, then it's a different team. That's why I say Harry Kane, the Manchester United team now, with Varane and Sancho, I think they're challenging for the title. I think that gold player, but I think for personality and character, that playing, you know, playing behind, could you play behind Fernandes and Pogba? I'm not sure about Pogba. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not them too old, yeah. No, yeah. 
Not the question. <laughs> <laughs> of course you would. No, but yeah. yeah. I think I think it'd be Roy or Cristiano. Okay, fair. That's interesting because we. We actually did a Skybet fan hope survey, asked 100 Man United fans which former player at their peak would improve Man United the most. 26% uh, said Ronaldo, 17% said Cantona, Roy and Beckham got 11% each. 11 only. And a, a massive 0% said Gary Neville. <laughs> One of us okay, <laughs> To be fair, my mum wouldn't pick Gary Neville if she was picking four me 90 players. <laughs> Want to bring the fans in? We, we touched a little bit on recruitment as well. I want to go straight to uh, Leeds fan. Do you think you've done enough? Do you think that Leeds can give any more? They gave so much under Bielsa last year. What can we expect from Leeds? Uh, just the same. We're just going to aim for the top and uh, do the best we can and just get as many points as possible and see what happens at the end of the season. Do you think there's going to be an element of burnout because Bielsa does, he, he pushes those players hard? No chance. No, uh, we're the fittest we've been for a long, long time. I mean, I've been seen watching Leeds for a long, long time and we've had a lot of dross over the last few years who didn't give a damn, didn't play for the shirt or anything and we've got a bunch of honest players there who will give their all for Bielsa and at the end of the day, as long as we're fighting, doing our best, then, you know, who knows, we, we'll attack till the, final, till the final whistle, so anything can happen. And we have actually been scoring goals where at one time we couldn't score a goal to save his life. Do you think the fans being in, you know, this season, that's the, the one thing, I know, I know the fans were in there in the Championship, of course, but for, for everyone getting leads back in the Premier League was Ellen Road, you know, a great rivalry with probably Man United. We had some great games with them, made a David O'Leary team. That, but, there's something special about Leeds, isn't he? You know, one yeah. club in that city, the supporters. Is, is there a big sort of thing to sort of get back into the stadium? Maybe more than what we see with other supporters, do you think? I, I think you'll see a different dimension this season. I think the, the refiner's fire that we've been through as fans and uh, as a club that we've had over the last 16 years, not including last season. Well, if you include COVID, COVID yeah, definitely. But it's, it's crystallised us as a support. It's made us different because we've, all the things that we've been talking about today, we've not been involved in that. We've been cocooned in League One and, and the Championship for all that time. The support has never really failed Leeds at all. Our average has never gone down below 20,000, even in League One. So that's crystallised our support. So if there is one support that is ready, and we'll be ready on Saturday because we'll be there on Saturday, <laughs> both Heidi and I, but we'll be ready for this season you're talking about Leeds. Now, you're talking about the, the difference between the championship and now. There is such a massive, massive support for Leeds now. And it's, and it's even surprised me. I mean, I've been going for 40 years. Heidi's been, been going way longer than I have. But the, the demand for tickets at Leeds now is huge. We've got 55,000 um, members of the club. That's not including season ticket holders. We've got 23,000 season ticket holders now which has been capped. Um, and then you're talking about a well, waiting list of approaching 30,000 for season tickets. I know for traditional clubs in, in Premier League, that's not a lot. But when you're talking about in the next two, three days, the, club, the club's going to come out with plans for, for developing the stadium, which needs it, 55 to 62,000. They're looking within five years. That is where we're going. Leeds are not here just to make up numbers in the Premier League, I'll tell you that for a fact. So are we looking at a new season now with a lot of hope? Absolutely right. But like I said, we're not here to make up numbers. Can I just ask a question? Because it will involve Leeds as well, but it also involves like Aston Villa, Everton. Because this is annoying me really at the moment, the way the Premier League and Gary as a club owner. The Premier League profit and sustainability rules uh, prevent, prevent my club from spending the money. We've got the fourth richest owner in the world or whatever it is. Can't put money into the football club because of this profit and loss. Now, at some stage, Aston Villa, the Grealish money's out them, but they've spent a lot of money, so they're going to be on the line to not be able to progress. Is, does that need changing? Because there's, all, there's the, big, the big six, uh, and Ty, you're in it, by the way, Arsenal are one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, For now. Uh, so the big six, the big six are always going to have more sponsorship, be on TV more, things yeah. like that. How do we... How are we able to predict? If Salford ever get to the Premier League, and if you stop sacking managers, they might. <laughs> if they ever get there, they'll only be, they'll only be so far you'll be able to go. No, uh, there's a simple way around this. I think this will be fixed. I always think, if, let's say, for instance, 
Abu Dhabi coming to Manchester City. Yeah. They've spent well above their revenues for the last 10 years and still doing it now. They just are. Mm. Now, they've inflated the sponsorships. You can do that, but to be fair, there's no need to do it. I generally think there can be a rule comes in where owners, if, let's say, for instance, Everton want to sign Harry Kane for 150 million, mm. and that owner puts the 150 million pounds in a bank that's secured against the Premier League, get a bond or guarantee. But not against the club. And his, not against the club yeah. and the wages, I think you should be able to buy that player because yeah. that is sustainable because he's put the money up. Yeah. So there is a way around this. So sustainability for me is the fact that the owner can afford to pay his obligations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's sustainability. That's because the, it seems like it's the only industry in the world where you as an owner can't, but can't put money into your own The horror business. stories are Leeds, where yeah. they've overspent thinking they were going to get in the Champions League yeah, and the yeah. owner didn't have the money. Yeah. And so Portsmouth. that's what needs to be stopped. So if, for instance, Leeds were going to buy a player this summer and they could prove they had the money, they should be able to buy that player, no yeah, problem. Yeah. But there should be a guarantee or a bond against it in place. Because at the we moment, we can't catch, we can't. It's like Newcastle open to get a takeover. They only get one summer to be able to do it. Yeah. And then if you don't get it right, which Leicester have Well, I mean, really. look, Newcastle's spending uh, the restrictions this summer horrific. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's go to Newcastle and Kendall. Quiet summer. Joe Willett potentially coming in. What, six is six for you? That's you the key word, though. Potentially. Potentially. How do you feel about the business or lack of this summer? It's been this way for several seasons now. This isn't, you know, the only season where we're not expecting anything. To be fair, since Steve Bruce came in, you know, Joe Linton, well, not, maybe not go there, um, 40 mil, St Maximin in the same window. Mm -hmm. um, last summer it was Callum Wilson, Jeff Hendrick, Ryan Fraser, Jamal Lewis. Um, but the problem is this time around, the whole takeover thing, as we've mentioned that, um, that was kind of in the air. And Mike Ashley, as we all know, he's not the most generous um, of football owners and he obviously isn't looking to put any money into a club that he doesn't probably believe he's going to own in the next one year, two year, you know, he's probably not going to look to put any money in then. Um, the issue I have now is that we aren't signing anyone. I know the window's still obviously ongoing at the moment, but there isn't even any talks. We were in for Tuan Zabi, who's gone to Aston Villa, you know, um, Asia, who's gone to... Uh, I think that's how you say his name, gone to Brentford. Um, and the only person we are currently in for right now is Joe Willock. Whereas we've let two centre-backs go. We've let Lejeune go permanently. Kel Watts has just gone to Wigan Athletic on loan. We're not improving or building on areas that are already weak. So for us now, it's a case of are we going to get anyone in? Because I don't probably believe we will. It may be a couple of loan signings, if that, towards the end of the window, which is normally what we like to do. Um, and we're not improving on areas of the squad that are extremely limited. We only have Wilson and Dwight Gale right now as out-and-out -out strikers in the squad. We've let Andy Cowell go, not that he was doing anything at that point. Um, we've let Andy Cowell go and also Muto's just gone as well. So we're not at, at a in a position to even improve those areas. So where do we realistically go from here? What does success look like no. for Newcastle? Survival, isn't it? For New it's survival for Newcastle. That's New the name of the game. New Newcastle is... It's a shocker. I've been, you know, I said it before, it's been demoralising going up there for the last seven or eight years. The football's average, the players, the investment's average, the feeling between the fans, the owners, the manager is average. So everything's down before a season yeah. starts. And Newcastle fans have had this now for a number of years. All I will say is it's that bigger club, it is a moment in time, not for the fact that ultimately at this moment in time it's a painful one. But like, say, an Everton or a Leeds, a Villa who've been down, or Everton haven't been down, but Villa, Leeds yeah. have been down. These are two bigger clubs. Newcastle is too big. It will be brilliant there again one day. They will have a Bielsa. They will have those players. They will have that spirit. That crowd will be bouncing. It will come, but they'll need to change ownership. They'll need to change managers. They'll need to have investment. And they'll become the club that, they, to be fair, should be again. It will happen. I think it's, it's a bit of a disgrace, really, with Newcastle. And I don't think there's too much difference, as you've just said there, between a Leeds and a Newcastle. I think you, you, you're both realistic where you think it's a dream one day to win the league, but you don't really expect it. But we're talking about listening to the, to the Leeds fan. You've just given me a look there. Why do you think you're going to win the league? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Who no, isn't? No, what I'm saying is every fan, as we said at the start, has hope. Not every fan has real belief that it's going to happen, but you've just got this buzz that we could, could we nick the FA Cup? Could Rafa do this? Could, could Bielsa do that? With Newcastle, there's no, absolutely nothing. none of that. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing you need as a football fan, to have hope. Not many football fans have got belief. We're very lucky we were involved with teams who most season would be challenging with something or could, could yeah. win something. Very few clubs do. I mean, you're talking about 
clubs the size of Everton and Tottenham going absolutely 20, 30 years about winning a trophy. They're huge football clubs who in the past have been successful. So most supporters don't expect to win a trophy each year, but they want to go into the season with a little bit of excitement, a little bit of a buzz. We've signed him. Listening to the Leeds fan talk about Leeds, you can see the depth and buzz of what's yeah. going on. But with Newcastle, it's just so flat and absolutely dead. And that just comes from Mike Ashley. But survival is survival is part of the game. Survival, you're talking about obviously Newcastle. So, so survival Newcastle is the main aim for Newcastle. We, the history we tell you about clubs who have struggled. I manage Sunderland next door to Newcastle. Sunderland's a huge club. They're in League One. You know, the clubs can you spiral downwards. I always say, talk about momentum. You get momentum that way, you get momentum that way as well. Great clubs. One of the clubs I played for, Nottingham Forest, they've been in the championship for 21, 22 years, I think it is now. Mm. You know, I, I got relegated with Nottingham Forest, brilliant manager, Brian Clough. So the game sometimes for Newcastle might be over the next two or three years until the owner decides to sell this, is survival. So I, I'm not saying you celebrate staying up, but you must look at it and go, well, look at all the other clubs around us, great examples we've just mentioned there, Leeds been relegated, Man City in League One a few years ago, Sheffield Wednesday, big clubs, as big as Newcastle, without a shadow of a doubt. So this idea of Newcastle now finishing 14... I think you ha that's what you have to accept, especially if you're not spending money on, on players. Accepting it though and being happy about it, I don't think that we should. We well, might yeah, have to think, accept I, it, I think we have. I don't think you should be happy about it, but you, ha you have to look at a bigger picture and say, listen, this is where we are with our owner, because whatever you say, the owner is dictating it. If he doesn't want to spend money, and the owner will look at Newcastle and go, well, I've got managers, I've had Rafa Benitez, I've got Steve Bruce, I'm paying enough, I'm, they're managing to keep us in the Premier League. I'm not spending 150, 200 million to get three or four places in the league. Mm. So again, we go back to it. It's a boring and football's a business. So the owners who own your football club, ultimately at some stage, they want to bring some money into the club. You know, it's not an owner from Asia or China. You've got, you've got a, an owner who thinks, I want to take some money out of Newcastle. He's not going to spend two or 300 million to get Newcastle to where? Tent? Night? Yeah, no. And that, it's not worth it. And that's the thing, that's what we would need. We would need that level of investment no, of now to even get, beyond, get beyond we've that. We've got now. examples here where Leeds and other clubs have thrown money at it mm. and they've not got it right but, and, and ended up in League One. I so be it, careful. Survival, almost. Uh, Sometimes Leech. you have to accept survival yeah, and go, that's where and we that, are. That's, I think that's, and where enjoy we, that's the Premier why League. we are so deflated because we've just accepted it yeah, and that's where we're at. Yeah, survival's part of the game. But last year, Newcastle were, were in the quarter semi final of the League Cup against Brentford. And lost to Brentford. So you still get opportunities in this game to say, OK, it's survival, but I tell you what, we, the chance we get to Wembley, and if you lose to a championship team, then you go, OK, let's not have a go at the owner too much. We, we got ourselves in a position to try and get to a cup final, and you didn't take it. But survival in the Premiership for Newcastle is, I think, the best they're going to get, and possibly a cup run. But they've lost, they've lost to small teams over the last few years in the cup. Same for Everton. I think Newcastle could become a Manchester City or a Chelsea. You know, we forget now where Chelsea and Manchester City were when they were picked up by the owners that they've got. There is no reason... No, but the point is, they were never going to win a league. Yeah, just, for me, they were, just, they were going up a little bit. They were never going to be... That. Chelsea were a club that wouldn't be bigger than Newcastle. Chelsea, for me, are not a bigger club than Newcastle. City are not a bigger club than Newcastle, going back 10, 15, 20 years. They weren't. But they can be. I think Everton, I always think about, you know, why did Shape Man so choose Manchester City over Everton or Leeds? or Newcastle, because he could have picked any of those clubs that were on a similar level and took them to the level that they're at now and brought Pep... I she was on the drink and didn't meet with the owners of Man City. <laughs> yeah, but that's, my, but that's my point, is that I think that there, New, Newcastle is a club that could easily have owners that could do a Chelsea, that could do a City. But then, absolutely, I generally... the rules change. No, but I generally think that yeah, there's still... Be, investment will be allowed into football clubs. It'll not, they'll not stop investment into football clubs. At the moment, they are, though, aren't they? At the moment, we've spent £1.6 million. Pound. We are on Amazon, a, a, a radio show, a while ago saying, I want to put hundreds of millions in, I'm not allowed to, because of the rules. Man, well, the lucky thing for Man City is, Man City have been a fantastic football forever, 30,000 in the second division, League One, whatever it is now. Everton have been incredibly, Everton have won more leagues than City and Spurs put together. But we're just pushed aside. We were big at, one time. We're, not, we're still a, a big club. We're not a big but team. But 20 years ago, yeah. City, Everton, Newcastle, mm. Leeds, you wouldn't be putting, you know, you, you wouldn't. You say you'd say Leeds and Newcastle were bigger than probably Everton and City in that in that period when we were Never. playing. Never. <laughs> but, but if you go ten years before that, Everton won of the big five. So it I depends what you look at. Back to the fifties. <laughs> yeah. No, you could. And we still won the yeah, we get on to the Middles were Burnley with big clubs back. Yeah, but Everton have been a big team from the whole start. Newcastle will get bought. They'll go like that. Newcastle will get bought. Newcastle will. Newcastle. 
I, I get what you're saying. Really. If you look at Newcastle's team now, that if that team stays up, you think they've done well because well. it's an average team. But in terms of like Aston Villa came up within the Championship, I don't know, a couple of years ago. It feels like there's a buzz about Eight Villa. Eight minutes from relegation. Even Leeds, there's that buzz. They just it just feels so flat. With Newcastle, but Aston Villa should have been relegated. They did a goal against uh, Sheffield United, so you yeah. need a bit of luck in this game as well. Yeah. But the biggest luck you want as a supporter, yeah, and, and then 12 who comes later, in, who comes into your club, who come, who owns your football yeah. club? We look at the clubs that went, who had difficult spells over the last 20, 30. Leeds, they probably look at the ownership there. Sunderland, Nottingham Forest, changed hand two or three times. People look for into the club, and they've had no feel for the club. It's just been pure. And I know, again, I go back to this business. I don't want to be contradicting myself, but they've had a feel for the club. These clubs, this, this roller coaster these all these clubs are on. Aston Villa is going through a great spell at the moment, the feel good factor. But what three or four years ago, what they were in the championship, going nowhere. That's the last thing you want as a club, as a club like Newcastle in the predicament that we're in, the fans not to be on board because then that will just spiral out of control because we're not on board. We're against Steve Bruce again in sort of a rougher situation. We're never going to be on his well, side. Sorry, I sort of interrupt, but you could say that about the United fans yeah. there. They're not on board with it. Maybe Everton would be disappointed with their ownership, just the way they're running it. They might go, oh, they're putting the money in, but just the way they're doing it. Yeah. There's a lot of people yeah. here, Aston Villa a few years ago, there was ownership there, you go. I, I worked at Nottingham Forest for us, there's ownership there, you go. Are they really the right people for Nottingham Forest? Yeah. Everyone at some stage sitting here would have said, at some stage, looking at their owner going, I'm not sure I'm happy with them. To Blackburn, Bolton, <laughs> Wigan, all these clubs that have been Sunderland. big clubs. Sunderland, Sunderland ownership over the last few years has changed and three or four times. And Sunderland's a fantastic football club. I know Newcastle won't agree with that. <laughs> Fant but like, I'll go back to the ownership. People who didn't really believe in the club, I know Sunderland and League One. League no, so what are you saying then? Are you saying Newcastle should be happy with Mike Ashley with what's going on? No, now I'm not saying happy, but except at the moment where you are and go, it's survival because there's other clubs around, like we keep referring to, Sunderland down the road, they're looking at Sunderland going, well, I tell you what, lucky we've not fallen that way because as much as they've lost momentum, there's... The, the, there could be more trouble ahead, Jamie. I'm, I'm not saying Newcastle fans should celebrate just staying in the Premier League, far from it, but I actually go, this is where we are at the moment, until ownership changes and the feel-good factor comes in. Survival is the Survival name of the game. Survival is a level of, a level of success. We could talk about Newcastle yeah. all day, every day, and, and the problems they have, but I want to talk about Crystal Palace. Um, I know one of your favourite sayings, failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. Do you think that Vieira's failure... He said that was in Valencia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. I'm much. getting onto that. I'm getting onto that. Right. Do you think? Do you think that Vieira's kind of, I guess, failures at, at Nice and in New York have helped him and will help him in his management at a club like Crystal Palace? I, I actually, before when you said about the surprise next season, all the that is actually one of my biggest intrigues next season. Patrick Vieira at Crystal yeah. Palace. They've had such stability with Roy Hodgson, and how they've performed. Never really thinking that they were going to go down. Never really thinking they were going to go into the top six, but just cemented perfectly. We're probably where Crystal Palace need to be. I think this is going to be really interesting to change the style, to change yeah. the belief, the culture of the club, which is what Patrick, I'm sure, will want to do. When you try and do that, it's difficult, and those players will have been used to the same training sessions. Roy's got a really sort of, he's got the same training sessions, he'll do them every single day. The players will be indoctrinated into that style of play, and it'll be difficult to get them out of that. You know, if you remember Steve Bruce, we went to um, Newcastle. And all of a sudden, I think he said, I've got to go back to Rafa's way of doing it because the players have just become so sort of accustomed See, to a lot of coach. the players have left Nev. A lot of the players that yeah, always had. Club I know, it's in their makeup. Yeah. It's in their DNA, I agree. Well, I mean, you... Oh, I'm intrigued. Imagine, I'm you, intrigued, like Gary, with Patrick, how they go yeah. there, because sometimes it's... I know one or two Crystal Palace fans who weren't happy with Roy Hodgson. They weren't. They just thought yeah. it was boring, they're very defensive, the way he sets up. But be careful what you wish for, because Palace could be that one where you look and go... And after three or four months, you look and go, Patrick, they don't know about the boring. and you go, yeah. oh, I know he didn't get that long, he don't, literally three or four weeks. So I'm intrigued with the Patrick. Yeah. You know, Patrick, how he does, he's obviously worked at Man City with the underage team, went to America, walked with Nice. I, I like Patrick, he's a good guy. I didn't, obviously, I had some good battles with him. And it'll be interesting how they do, because fans, most supporters, everyone yeah. wants more. Everyone wants just that bit more. And, again, be careful what you wish for. You, know, you, you think it could be dangerous? Well, I think Roy Hodgson's reputation could go up even more in the next few months, because for Patrick, and he's bringing one or two young players in, he's brought them to the championship, and would certainly change our style of play. But unless they're really good going forward and they're scoring loads of goals, Palace will be up against it. You Scott Parker last season in the Premier League, who's yeah. obviously a good coach, he put a style of play into them, but I think Roy Hodgson probably would have kept, may have kept Fulham up just through his experience, his know-how, his style. to lose. He's just like, yeah. But Gary he, makes the point, I'm going to interrupt you, just, sorry Gary. <laughs> Gary talks about Scott Parker, another coach where people go, you know, a, a new upcoming coach, 
you know, he's, he's good on the training pitch, but he got relegated. You know, yeah. I, I like the coaches who get good results. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. you know I, I, is that a big problem? Yeah. You, know, you can coach players, but also try and win the odd football match. Go on, Carrie. I, I don't think the actual Crystal Palace job was, was a job if you were looking as a manager and thinking, oh, I always want to take that. Mm. And what I mean by that is the players had got... They were always the old, every time done, they were the oldest team, I think, in the Premier League, basically. A lot of those players may now have left, or a few of them ran out of contract. Brought a couple of players in, but Ezzy's got a real bad injury as well. He was a, probably Achilles, the best yeah. player for them yeah. last season. And I, and I do fear for Crystal Palace, because they were always that team. We talk about teams challenging, maybe in the top ten, challenging the Europa League, and the teams you think were going to go down. Crystal Palace were always your banquet to be like yeah. 14th. They were just never in the relegation, never threatening in the top ten. It was just, they were there all the time. And I do fear they could be the team who maybe, when you say you don't expect to go down, if Roy Hodgson was manager, no one here would be saying, we think Crystal Palace will go down. But now Roy Hodgson's not there. I, I could see Crystal Palace being in that fight to stay in the Premier League. It's a great job for Patrick. We yeah. look at Patrick, he lost his job at Nice, done a decent job there. He wants to come back. Obviously, we've done some work on the TV. He was looking to move back to London. He's got a team in the Premier League. who've got. There'll still be a bit of experience. He's been given a few yeah. bob to spend. It's a dream job for Patrick to come back and work in the Premiership. Yeah. Great opportunity for him. Too much too soon or not? Justin, I, it's so difficult being a manager. And I think what he'll try and do, he'll have his beliefs, he'll have his ideas, he'll want to play a certain way. And he won't want to... He'll go in there and he'll put them in. And then if you don't get a few results, you've been there, I've been there, I was over there in Valencia when you're trying to do something and you're not getting results and the pressure's building and it's awful. I hope I he does well. I hope he does yeah. well. I hope he does really well. I mean, we, we, we just, I think there's a risk just because Roy Hodgson's been so steady, he's so knowledgeable, and mm. Patrick's coming into his first job in the Premier League. So I think there's a risk. There's a risk attached to Crystal Palace this season that we wouldn't ordinarily put to it. But there's also an intrigue and excitement because he might just go and completely blow us away and they might just take to it, the players. Fair play. Um, I want to open it up to all the fans. You've, we're going to start off with uh, the City fans. I think you've... You've made some good points already. Is there anything that you want to throw to the grass? How far do you think Greenwich can actually go? I mean by that, um, I guess, comparison to other players that maybe some of you guys have played with, because he, he's an incredible player already, and I'm sorry, mate, for nicking him from you. Um, <laughs> but, like, obviously, we've been blessed over the years with the likes of David Silva, you know, Sergio Aguero, and he's been given the number 10 shirt as well, which is Aguero shirt. What do you think the ceiling limit is for someone like Jack Greenish? Because we've talked about how he could improve, but are we talking about a guy who could be, you know... Uh, right at the very top of the game, the way that you guys perceive someone like David Silva or something like that. I know he's a very different player, um, but how far can he go in your personal opinion? I think with Grealish, I always remember when, Z look, Z when you mention Zidane and Grealish, it's dangerous because people say he's comparing him to Zidane and not. But when Zidane was at Bordeaux, there was this feeling that like he didn't have a position, where do you play him? He's got talent, but I'm not quite sure about him. Will he come to United, goes to Juventus? All of a sudden, a brilliant Juventus manager, Lippi, a brilliant Juventus team, grab yeah. hold of him. <laughs> and turn him into something that's like out of this world. And I look at Grealish's physique, it's incredible. Oh yeah, he's and, cool, and, he? and Zidane, Zidane's physique was incredible. And I look at Pep's coaching and I just think that if the same level of improvement to Sterling could happen to Grealish, you've got something that's not just talented and potential now, it's like, it's incredible. And one, one thing Grealish does, and Guardiola commented, even after his cameo against Leicester, and we lost that game unfortunately, he draws people towards him. When, you, when you've got that, you've got to bear in mind, all of a sudden, we're going to have Foden, and right, De Bruyne, Pep, the Pep, space. Pep got interviewed before the game the other day about signing Jack. The first thing he said is, when he's 20, why did you sign him for a drum million? He's 25. So straight away, he's thinking, yeah. I'll work with this kid. He didn't say he's, uh, he's amazing, he's the finished product. He said he's 25. That was the first, so he, he, he'll work with Jack. And what you want as a manager, I said, we're well, we can, as a manager, you want options. And Jack yeah, yeah, will give him options. And if we all went to watch Jack Grealish tomorrow in a game, I guarantee we'd all come away. No matter, I've watched Jack at championship level. I've seen him underage with Ireland, because he was Irish for a while. And, um, <laughs> and every time you watch him, you come away, you go, he's, he's the only player you talk about. That's what good players do. They affect the game. They get you talking about. Every team that played against Aston Villa probably hated Jack Grealish. He's a cheat. He's a diver. He's this. He's soft. His hair is calves. He's soft. <laughs> because there's an element of, because he catches you, right? He affects yeah. the games. And this is a kid who's still not a regular for England. Garrett still doesn't trust him in the games. But that's because he's 25 and he's going, he'll go with Pep and he'll be working with better players and he'll be playing in Champions League games and that pressure will come. And if you listen to Jack talk, and what I've always said about Jack Reason, I like him, even his interviews, this price tag won't bother him. He's gone to a brilliant team, he's working with Pep. He said that, he's, of course he is, because the top players do. Ronaldo came, Ronaldo came to Man United, Rooney, 
They walked in the dressing room. No fear in these kids. They've got courage. Courage to want the ball. Courage to be the most expensive player in the world. Courage is not about nailing somebody in a football match. Courage is wanting the ball when you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're on a big stage uh, and the fans are on your back and Jack's getting booed and people go, Jack will say, give me the ball. He came on the other day in the, the charity shield, the community I was at the game. He wasn't that great with his end product and all that stuff. But he got on it. He made stuff happen. Um, this is uh, a little bit different, but I wanted to talk about racism in football currently. Um, but currently, you know, if England were to play a final tomorrow or yesterday, we'd be waking up here today and thinking, uh, seeing racial abuse at footballers again. We're going into a new season. Are we going to go through a whole season without a footballer being racially abused? I don't think that's going to happen, really. So for me, I actually think that the people with power that can change things in the UK, that can make changes to the country, need to start making a change and putting education into place, in schools, into workplaces, into communities, and to stop this racism happening. If these people with power, if, 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 if these people with power have the power to lock down the UK, then they have the power to lock down racism and throw away the key. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Well, you, you know, we go back to the summer tournament where you know high-ranking ministers, the prime minister, uh, the home secretary, said that it was okay that they didn't condemn the fans for booing the players that were taking the knee. But I mean, seriously. The, fe the players were taking the knee to basically highlight inequality and the racist offences that have occurred and continually occurred over decades and hundreds of years. And our leadership in this country said that it was actually OK for people to display their displeasure at the knee. Seriously. I mean, what I'm saying to you, it's about the people in power. We've got a real problem in this country at this moment in time, and I know that I'm whinging on Twitter every single day about politics at the moment, but I really think we've got a dangerous government. I think every season ticket holder, every administrator, every pundit, everybody who works in football or benefits or comes to football or uses football should be part of an education programme. They can be, and the Premier League can fund that. So the need is about giving people the equal opportunity, giving them the, the chance and it's the same with South Asians in, in football. You know, we want the chance. We want, we want to be footballers. We enjoy football. We love football. I'm here today to represent the South Asian community because I enjoy football as well. That's right. But it goes on. I, I, I think there's no quick fix. You're talking about educate, educating people. But there is. I've done the community shield on... Um, it was a Saturday or Sunday with Ian Wright. And I think Wright, documented that. We were getting dogs abused by supporters. Yeah. Irish this and Irish that. Wright, he was getting... The, I say the usual stuff, even for me to say that is out of order. And we're saying, what, what, what do you do? It, like, no matter, in all walks of life, whatever, whatever football ground, there, there's going to be scumbags. There, there will be scumbags at every club who will abuse people for the, co the colour of their skin, their background, where they're from. There's no I, quick fix to this. I think there's a, there's a big thing that I think that has started to happen, which I think will have a real impact. I think there needs to be consequence. Yeah. So the, the con punishment's not been strong. The consequence enough, is... Yeah. Honestly, if someone has uh, committed a racial offence on social media or in a stadium or on the street, you have to basically, obviously, ban them from the ground. You have to make sure they don't come into a football ground again. But you also have to write to their employer. Yeah. I don't know any employer of note that would employ someone who is basically guilty of racist offence. So they would lose their job. Once there is consequence and financial consequence, they'll, they'll stop doing it. And then you'll start to see education. The education's got to go hand in hand with the actual punishment. Both have to be in place. But England played Bulgaria a few years ago. Remember the players yeah. walked up, they stopped the game. And Bulgaria, I think they got it. £8,000, £10,000. A fine to uh, yeah. it. That's not going to hurt. Mark, it looks part of for this as well, for example. Like we saw Ron Atkinson, who has a future, uh, sorry, a, a great past in football, but after his comments on ITV, he was still employed by MUTV. Um, you look at Chelsea's treatment of John Terry and how they still lauded him after all that. Obviously, you guys have spoken about how you dealt with Suarez. Isn't it up to the clubs for when they've got an asset to actually deal with it in-house first? Because yeah. it always seems like, oh, if it's a fan in the stands, the club will be quick to go, he's not a fan. Let's get him out. He's not one of us. But when it's someone within the squad, the punishment no needs to be stronger. So, I, think, yeah, I think Portsmouth sacked a few players recently, didn't Portsmouth? They were youth players, though. They were worth a few mil. Point there, what you're making about is 
in the Premier League and education or, you know, we don't condone it, racism or the players on social media after the England penalties, but you're talking about when it actually happens in your own club, stuff, it's man. completely different. And again, unfortunately, it comes down to a, it's a financial situation well, like because the, you, you, what you said, it could potentially be worth a lot of money, but it's been very interesting. So it was Portsmouth players? But I think it was Portsmouth, yeah. wasn't it? Was yeah, that yeah, right? yeah, well, if, that was Port, if that was Portsmouth the captain or <laughs> the, 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 the top goal scorer, the most valuable asset, that is that, that is a problem. That's where, in some ways, clubs are hypocritical in that mm. they will come down tough on racism. I think after the Luis Suarez uh, incident, I think you may uh, know the back. I think we played Oldham in the FA Cup. It just rings a bell, and one of the supporters racially abused a uh, an Oldham player. I think they got banned for the season, or maybe banned for life. And there was that thing then in the press at the time, and it's. A football club is not going to sack a player. They're not. Now, whether we, we agree with that or not, if, if there's certain situations that have, have, have popped up at different times with different football clubs. And when, when someone's an asset for 40, 50 million, and, and I said at the time, uh, when we Patrice ever came on Monday Night Football, we got it badly wrong as a football club. But then it all comes down to the fact that it was, it was Luis Suarez. Mm. It was the best player. But imagine huge, we, do you understand what I mean? So... Yeah. It's not right, but if that was a Manchester United player, or if that was a, a Leeds player, an Everton player, the, every club would react the same. So it's difficult to sort of like say Liverpool should have done this because when you've got something of that valuable, and you're right in terms of sacking employees, but football clubs won't do it. There's no doubt we're going to come back to this on the overlap throughout the, the next few episodes. But um, Rory, Chelsea fan, uh, <laughs> you're sleeping. He's excited. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I did actually want to hear your thoughts. I've, I've caught a lot of uh, stick recently regarding my thoughts around Timo Werner. I have a Twitter feed that is generally full of Chelsea fans that will tell you he's going to come good, he's got all the minerals to be a complete Premier League player, he's got everything it, it takes, and this year he's going to hit the ground running. I totally don't subscribe to that school of thought at all. I don't see anything there to believe that that's going to happen. Combine that with the fact that we're going to offload, or it's at least looking like we're going to offload Tammy Abraham, a player that I rate incredibly highly, a player who I actually believe could get to the zenith of the game. I think he's top class. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Do you feel like Timo Werner has what it takes, or I, do you think Chelsea have made a mistake? I, I thought it was really interesting. We did Monday Night Football on, I think, I think it might have been Tuchel's second game in charge, and he, and he come in, I don't know if you were on the show, Gary, and he said something about Timo Werner. And they were asking about where he was playing him, and he actually played him just behind the striker to the left. And, it, and he said something that just stuck with me. He said, he's not a fixed striker, which I think in what he was trying to say, he wasn't a striker with his back to goal. Mm. And that's why a lot of the time he, he probably played Giroud up there, at times he played a false nine with Havertz there. He's now got Lukaku. So I, don't, I, I wouldn't write Timo Werner off, because I think that pace he's got is really dangerous do and you, know, you wouldn't want to play you know, against it. You know, and I, I sorry, I, I just think that can still be a huge asset because I think Chelsea, those players who play behind the striker or if you play a false nine, a lot of them are very similar. And I still think, I'm not saying he's going to play every week and he's going to rip the Premier League up, but I still saw him at times last season, not in terms of his finishing, but in terms of how dangerous he was and you think, I wouldn't want to play against him. And I think if he played actually behind, a little bit deeper and was looking towards the goal and was making runs forward rather than having his back to goal. I still think he'd be an asset to Chelsea. Obviously, you bought him to be a centre forward to score the goals. I don't think he will be that, but I still think he can be a huge asset to Chelsea. But you see, that's, that's my worry. You know the way that he misses chances? I think that happens to the best strikers. We see that on a regular basis. But it's sitters. It's like <laughs> sitter after sitter. <laughs> and you're like, like, I can kind of deal with a wasteful striker, but somebody who's that profligate, who can miss that sort of chance, it makes me wonder, like, is, is, that's why is he a professional footballer? Is he, is he a Premier League footballer? That's why they're spending big money on Lukaku. The, the club and the staff will look at that and go, he probably is a bit short, but you still maybe persevere with a player because the one thing that's more worrying that is a player is not getting chances. And I agree with you, some of his chances, they're huge in big moments. And at a club, at a big club where you're expected to win that, you give a certain player, a striker, a few chances. We had, I suppose, Diego Forlan when he came to United. If you remember, Diego, you know, played a lot of games, didn't score that many. He scored against us. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay. quite easy. I, um, <laughs> yeah, but it didn't mean say he wasn't a good player, and if he went off and had a brilliant career. So, so, and again, the time when you have a player coming to your club with COVID and all this, sometimes it can play in the player's mind. But I, I, again, I'd persevere with him a little bit longer. But 
at the bigger clubs, these strikers, when they keep missing them chances, it's only natural they face the chop. And you're on about some fans like him, some, but that's just, of course, the nature of the game, isn't it? It's just yeah. about opinions. But would you hang your hat on him getting 25 goals like we've been saying Kane and Lukaku? No, you wouldn't, because he's missing all those chances. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, look, I, think you just, I think if you reset your expectations and instead of looking at him as the man and think of him as one of your four or Squad five player. strikers, he wasn't like a £100 million sign. I think he was still a decent fee, but he wasn't massive. Mm. With Lukaku there, there, and I mean, stuck right up front being the man, honestly, whichever two of the ones that you've got left that you put around them, they're all really good. All, whether that's Mount, Ziyech, Pulisic, Werner, absolutely fantastic wide strikers to go alongside uh, Lukaku. Honestly, once you've got that pivotal striker up there, the rest of it can be, honestly, it's fine. You, you, I, I think he can still give you something that you haven't yeah. got, as Gary's mentioned. He, and even Lukaku, to be honest, is probably he wouldn't be as quick, I, wouldn't, I don't think, as Timo Werner. And, and I just think he, he can give you something different. And when Roy just said, would you hang your hat on to get 25 goals? But now you've got Lukaku. He doesn't need to get 25 goals. Yeah. Lukaku's job is to get the 25 goals. Could he, get, could he get 10 to 15? That could be the difference between sort of winning a title or he won the Champions League last year, but that could be the next step. He doesn't have that pressure. That's Lukaku's pressure. Yeah. Can he just chip in? Yeah. United's yeah. greatest season. Sorry, I just make the point. United's greatest season, 99. People talk about the strikers with, with four very good options. So as Lance coming off the bench like Ali, Coley, Teddy, whatever it might have been. And that's what you want as a manager of the big clubs. You want three Fantastic. or four options. Last question, we're going to go to uh, Nicky. Um, I've got a question about, um, you're sitting on a stage there speaking about, you know, all these hundreds of, million of millions of pounds. Like, it, it, it's, 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 it's lots and lots of money, isn't it? Like, when you go back to, to, to Roy, he said he had a, a clause in your contract for 3.5 million. You know, and we're now we're talking about 150 million and, and all that in, 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 this, in this sort of, short space of time, uh, within our lifetime anyway. Um, so with this Super League stuff, and I know you said you don't want to go on about it too much and all that, but you know, you guys were you know, the, the, the first to sort of condemn it. Um, with what's happening at Barcelona, it looks like it's happening to Inter, and there could be Real Madrid could be in trouble and all this. Is this, the, do you feel like this is the start of the collapse of this bubble, of this, of this huge... Because there's only so many millions and billions, you can't go into the trillions because you, you, you're then talking about like the GDPs of countries and things like that. Is this the start of the collapse? This has been on the cards, what you mentioned. This has been on the cards for 10 or 15 years. I done my pro licence, believe it or not, about 16, 17 years ago, my pro licence, and they got people in talk. And, and the guy said it, he says, listen, where the Premier League is going, be, a lot of clubs will be bought by Americans, he made that point and they'll want to turn it into something like the NFL. So what's happened over the last few months? It's been on the cards, and it won't go away. I know Gary's probably, you can dip into a bit more, obviously, as an owner of a club. It's not going to go away because there's so much money and there's so much greed. But this didn't just happen over the last six months. This has been on the cards for 15, 20 years. And that's why we're talking about the NFL. I think the NFL is the only league in the world where every team actually makes a profit. And of course, I don't want to go down the road of no relegation, all that stuff, same in the MLS. But that's what happens when you get, obviously that was mostly American owners at the time. It was just nothing but pure greed. These, these owners who were talking about the Super League couldn't care about supporters, couldn't care about academies or history of football clubs. Purely down to money. That's what the Super League was about. Where some, some clubs couldn't even enter it. Some clubs, there was no relegation, no competition. We've well, spent here the last two or three hours talking. We're talking about the, the idea of someone winning the league teams getting relegation, all that was out the window. No relegation. It Sometimes was, you enjoy them games more than anything else. Honestly, teams fighting for their lives. It was a despicable thing that they put forward, honestly, because you think about Leeds and the fact that Leeds would, you know, if they, if they bring that in, and Sunderland, for instance, you mentioned before, you know, it just becomes, everything becomes more difficult. The idea of fair competition, that you can have relegation and, and promotion is sacrosanct in this country. One thing you say is that, you know, the TV money has plateaued, so it's now come down as well domestically. So you say that that means that there is a, a natural reset happening. You know, there's no doubt, I'm, you know, at Salford in League Two at the moment, the market is stuck. Players aren't moving, loans aren't happening. We can't get, things are just so slow at this moment in time. So there's a natural reset occurring through COVID, naturally. There'll always be those clubs, Roman Abramovich, you know, Manchester City, United have got money just jamming through the wealth. 
that can obviously go and spend money when they want because they've got vast wealth and they can see through a major economic crisis. However, football can't. Generally, football can't. Mike Ashley won't be able to at this moment in time as an example. He'll be suffering badly in the last 12 to 18 months potentially, as will other owners. So I think there is a natural reset happening. One thing that I would really look at, and I know I've championed it a lot, Tracy Crouch announced that there are an independent regulator is coming into football in the next few months. Honestly, it's the biggest thing that could happen to protect football against what would be rogue owners going and trying to put what would be these schemes forward that essentially protect their wealth and protect the greed that, to be fair, Roy's talked about just there, because they will strip English football of what it's always had, which is fair competition, the pyramid, promotion and relegation, the idea that it's more, you know, we know it's more weighted towards the big clubs, we get that, we know that already, but there still has to be a chance for someone to take Manchester City, a Chelsea, a Salford, a Gillingham, there still has to be that dream that that club can still go up the leagues, there has to be, and that they can get into the Champions League, you can't take that away. And so I think ultimately there is a reset moment, I think the last 12 months, through economic crisis you see greed like never before, and they've literally tried because of desperation. You look at what's happening over there in Europe at this moment in time, in Italy and in Spain, they are desperate. And they needed the Premier League clubs and our clubs got sucked in, yeah. naively. I, I, I agree, but as I say, when you look at Barcelona, what's happening at Barcelona, and I know that you've got the progression of, of, of COVID, has, I think has accelerated that, you know, that collapse. Um, but even if that hadn't got to that point, is that Barcelona, you're talking about Barcelona 10 years ago, won everything. Everything that you can win in a game, they, they, they would have. The, they've got a, a monopoly with Real Madrid in, in Spain, where they get a majority of the TV money yeah. and everything. So there's no more that can go there. You can only give out. So if you if you earn a pound and spend two every year, you're going to end up broke. That, and that's their own football clubs being obviously not run right and, and organisations. And we're three ex-players who earned really well out of football, and the players are earning really well out of football. And I would never criticise it good luck to you, earn what you want, but I've had this debate with Liverpool fans where certain players have gone for free and a club will say, oh, we've let this player go for free, but wages now over a four-year period of the transfer fees. So, Genie Wijnaldum, if he signs for Liverpool for four years, we're talking 30 million. Liverpool could go and sign a midfield for 30, 40 million. And, and that's when you're talking, what you're talking about where it's not sustainable. The actual wages now are so, so big and that's not a criticism. But Liverpool fans right now are upset that Liverpool aren't... People saying Liverpool aren't spending money, they're not investing. But they've had four or five players now sign contracts and we know the figures involved there. That is a huge outlay to a football club that I think supporters don't probably understand a little bit and maybe criticise owners too much because the sums now, as I said, they do feel like transfers. And, and it is a worry when you see teams like Barcelona, Inter Milan, two of the giants of European football having huge problems. But at the Premier League, as Gary's just mentioned... We're lucky because of the product that we've got, that this Super League, people say Super League and we were going to join a Super League, it wasn't. The Premier League had six clubs in it. It was basically them wanting to join the Premier League in some ways. No other league had six clubs in it. It was only the, the top two or three from Barcelona, top two or three from Italy, the same in, in Spain. They want what we've got. Now in terms of the TV deals and we still want the best players, but as we've mentioned here, if the TV deal has sort of hit a plateau, other things have to hit a plateau, otherwise something could happen with one of the clubs if they miss out on the Champions League for a year or two. They could have huge problems. But the beauty is, I would love, I would love, I, I, I just want to make it, the beauty though, with all these, this greed creeping into the game, even more so the last few months, the reaction obviously of the supporters of the last few months yeah. has reminded the owners of what the game is about. United fans going in there, causing havoc, Liverpool fans, <laughs> there's been, and, and up and down the country, I just don't mean on two clubs, and all of a sudden the owners have had to take notice which there's been some sort of plus come out of it. We could, we could sit here and talk all day. I just want to say we've run out of time. Thank you so much to the fans. You've been fantastic. I love the back and forth. Gary, Roy, Cara, it's been, uh, it's been sensational. Guys, make sure you like, comment and subscribe to The Overlap and we'll see you next time.